everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, for us today for Viewpoints, Contemporary Mapping and Global Histories. I'm joined by Carson Evans, Connor Moynihan, and Alan Burskin. And I thought it would be good for us to introduce ourselves uh, individually before we get into the next bit of the program. But uh, I'm the Nancy Prophet Fellow in Costume and Textiles Department, and my bachelor history is in, or sorry, my bachelor is in uh, history and art history. And in this collection, I focus more on Pan-African and Islamic art. Uh, and so, yes, we'll be talking about that a bit more, but uh, I'll leave it to Carson now. Hi, I'm Carson, and I am the Digital Media Fellow at the RISD Museum. Uh, I have a degree from RISD in Graphic Design and also a, a BA in Humanities. That's my background. Connor, would you like to go? Hi, everyone. I'm Connor Moynihan. I'm the Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow in Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at RISD Museum. Um, I'm uh, also a PhD candidate at the University at Buffalo, um, uh, where I look at contemporary art, but specifically artists that are from the, the Middle East or North Africa that are working in um, Europe and the United States and how they contend with, with the legacy of Orientalism and primitivism in their practice. I'm Alan Briskin. I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Rhode Island. And my last book was called A Vision of Yemen, The Travels of a European Orientalist and His Native Guide. Uh, so we're going to start off with a discussion about, a double take um, discussion about this works on paper view or in the prints, drawings and photographs department. Um, so I, to give a little bit of my own perspective uh, before Connor goes, uh, since I focus on Pan-African and Islamic art, I'm really drawn to the ways that um, diaspora movement has kind of been traced across the globe. And so my understanding of this piece kind of came from the artist and her cultural background more so than the materiality. Um, but Mona Hatoum is a uh, of Palestinian descent born in Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, and her background, she was born in the country, uh, I think a couple years after uh, the UN's Resolution 181, the partition of the uh, British Mandate of Palestine was passed so that it became an Arab and Jewish state. So already her, her background, just four years after the partition, is marred by somewhat conflict and violence. And um, her, her identity in Lebanon was never really fully shaped because uh, I don't think they were ever given citizenship, full citizenship. And so she was heading to, I think, university or maybe visiting in uh, Beirut, or sorry, in London. And so she found her way to the UK and then the, the Lebanese civil war in the 1970s started and she got stuck. Um, so I'm like really drawn to her, her, her movement and how this kind of I guess this understanding and maybe my biases kind of make it so that I read her work as uh, kind of tracing this. Um, and so, yeah, I was drawn to, well, I was confused with this work too because I had only seen the picture before seeing it in person. And to me, my reading is that uh, the paper, since, since we know it's of paper, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't include that in the description, but um, like I would, I would imagine that the, the land masses are the ones that are, um, full of material and depth and like substance and it's actually reversed in that the water is um, the oceans, the waterways are what's the actual paper and then the land masses are empty and uh, kind of not erased, but uh, it's, it's just, it goes against what my perspective and, and expectations would be. Um, but yeah, what, what, are, what are your thoughts, Connor? Yeah, I think it's, I think that's really important as you're mentioning to highlight that that inversion that we see because it is really hard when you see a reproduction of this work right so what we're seeing is we're seeing a sheet of paper quite a large sheet of paper and all the continental masses uh, as Tayana described those are all negative spaces so there's actually if you were holding a sh this sheet up if you were able to touch it unframed you wouldn't there's no paper there you're seeing straight through it so you just have the emptiness of the masses of the continents um, and and what I love about this work and also thinking about maps is, and, and Mona Hatoum's practice more broadly is she is so interested in, in really 
ordinary objects and ordinary things and really these simple inversions or contradictions that can be embedded in those that make us rethink them. So again, we have this very simple sheet of paper. It's a cotton-based paper, which is um, a point I'll, I want to circle back to. Um, but um, what's, I, what's uh, what's really, uh, as Tiana mentioned, you know, you, you have the, the continents that are sort of erased. And so what you have is just the, these edges of the continent that you see. Um, and how she um, achieved this is when you're making um, a paper, you know, she would have, you, know, you have a screen and you have a decal. And she used a very sort of what we might describe as a high relief watermark. And a watermark traditionally would leave a very subtle image that you'd see through light. But here it's, it's, it's was at such a degree that you can, um, that the, there's just a gap. But when she's then removed that paper from the screen, what's rather uncontrollable would be all the the deckled edges that you see. So all the edges that are around the continents, those are sort of like beyond her control, right? It's like how that shape is going to happen is, is, is a little bit up to chance. Um, and I think the chanceness of borders is really connects to Tiana, what you mentioned about her history, right? This idea that, you know, she's of Palestinian descent, um, or she is Palestinian, she was in Lebanon. And then when she goes to the UK, all of a sudden borders became a very real thing for her in a new way, right, where she could no longer get back to Lebanon. And sort of how borders are both arbitrary, um, but have real consequences. Um, and she's doing this through such a subtle, subtle way. Um, yeah, so that's, those are my initial thoughts. Um, I don't want to like spoil too much of the rest of the conversation. Um, but I would love to also hear Carson and Alan, if you guys have perspectives about this, I guess, kind of coming to it um, from a digital and historic background? So if I can, if I can jump in now, um, what struck me about um, this map was the ecological dimension, that it's not a political map. We, we don't have borders anywhere, um, but the land mass is a negative space. And uh, what it brought to my mind was global warming and how the oceans are perhaps more significant to us than they've ever been before. They actually encroach on that, on, on that land mass. Uh, they, they threaten uh, very significant human communities across, across the world. So uh, when I saw this map, it wasn't the political factors that jumped to mind. It was this sort of looming ecological disaster. Now, maybe I'm projecting, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I just thought I'd share that. One thing, uh, I've only seen this piece on, on the website in this digital form, so I had uh, no idea that it was created with a deckle edge, and that's really exciting to learn about and seeing the close-up images with the fibers and that imprecision. And you had spoken about uh, it being cotton paper, and I know that there's a lot of history and significance in the cotton um, and in paper making, uh, and I wonder, you'll probably get to that, but if you could speak more to that, I'm really curious. I can, yeah, I can jump in. I think for me, that's where I also read the politics, and I, but I also think the environmental side of this is a really important point of borders are, the continental borders are changing for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but cotton, I think, is really in, important for this one because Mona Hatoum has, has done a projection and she's done a series of these maps. So we have the one that's on paper, but she's also done one on velvet and she's also done one on a prayer mat. Um, and I think these like simple, you know, these, these, these very simple uh, changes really change the way that we see it. So with cotton, I'm thinking about the global circulation of cotton and how cotton, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's produced in warmer climates. It's been produced for thousands of years, but it's, it's, a, it's a quite profitable um, product and it's really shaped a lot of global politics. You know, thinking from the American perspective with, with, um, with slavery and the United States, um, I, it's, um, I think it's just, again, by, by just this simple material, by drawing attention that we're looking at cotton and we're looking at a map, she really, brings us to focus on those two things by really erasing all these other details. She really draws attention without really pointing to a conclusion, but really thinking about how I think 
you know, if we think of the water being all connected here, thinking about the globe being all connected, thinking about what can circulate in those spaces. And in this case, I was thinking about cotton and how the, that impacts humans as well. And so kind of going off of uh, Island, I don't think your reading about environmentalism was not too far fetched at all. Um, I, I, was, I was also drawn to the significance of the water and how its presence was so much more than the land. And um, I think historically, like with my studies of um, oceanic trade networks, I think, like one of the um, comparisons and juxtapositions in the exhibition opening up in about, in about a month, um, sorry, in a month, was talking about um, India and East Africa. So like there's just the, the, the idea that water, waterways serves as a movement both in the past and now with all of the um, refugee crises um, in the past like century really, but especially this decade alone, um, although we're in a new one now. But um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm very thankful for all of these perspectives and I'm excited to get into the rest. And I just have a few detail shots um, to kind of, yeah, talk about that edge that, or the, I, I, I don't even know now, this decal uh, process that you two were speaking about, but um, yeah, just getting a little bit more into where these specifics are. And just before we go forward, um, wanted to point out that this was one of the uh, artworks in the collection that led to me and Carson having a conversation about a map to present to the public. Um, so this projection, Mona Hatoum chose the Gall Peters projection, which uh, if you're familiar with maps is a lot more elongated than usual. And I'm sorry about the sound if it's too, too many at once, but um, there is, so you can kind of get a sense from this map that Africa is a lot longer than maybe what we might expect. Um, and so I have some more pictures, but uh, yeah, just seeing, the different types of distortions and um, compromises that come with taking a particular um, map projection. And so I just got these off of Wikipedia because one of the, uh, I, I'm a very like, uh, what's the word, avid user of Reddit and I love the ways that some of the digital content creators and artists kind of superimpose um, things onto maps. And so getting a sense and just comparing uh, the different projections and how much these borders and countries and continents fluctuate. Um, so yeah, the, the Mercator one is one that I was um, very much akin to in school. I think this is what all of the world history and history textbooks would focus on. Uh, and I, I think one of the biggest uh, conflicts and uh, issues with this one is that the comparison between the poles and the equatorial regions, like Greenland is not at all the same size as Africa. And so they, there are different distortions and the ways that uh, it kind of leads people to understanding these spaces. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't want to get too much into that alone. But um, Carson, I, I, I wanted to end on this one before getting into the, the digital content that you created for the exhibition. Sure. Do you, do you want me to talk about the Vingle Triple? Yeah, um, so as Tiana explained, uh, we set about thinking uh, what kind of projection would be uh, most appropriate to show what we wanted to show and have the least distortions. And you can see that lots of people have thought about this over time. Um, and in this case, uh, I think Mr. Winkel and Mr. Triple came up uh, rather simultaneously with a similar solution. And as you, the, compared to the last two, this particular projection is not forced into a square. It has a kind of oval shape, which um, can be, has its benefits and its limits, but in a lot of ways helps to uh, reduce distortion. So we settled on this one because it is so so part of why you get these issues is if you think about um, the globe being a sphere and if you want to flatten a sphere it will obviously get uh, to flatten that 
you know, if you've ever peeled an orange, you don't end up with a perfect rectangle from your orange peel. You got lots of shards. So how can you get a map that is not a bunch of shards so that you can see relationships, but you're not getting relationships that uh, make Greenland look absolutely gigantic? Um, so in terms of math that I don't quite understand, this projection is said to be uh, one of the more accurate representations or one of the better compromises from going from a sphere to a flat 2D surface. Yeah, and I'm just thinking back to some of the conversations we were having and why we might have gravitated more towards this one. I think I might have it backwards because there have been a lot of changes just over the past 20 years for uh, the best projections, but um, I think UNESCO and the National Geographic Society hone in more on this one. So, of course, it's, it's, it's always a balance according to what, um, what compromises and what, what negative aspects get centered through. But, um, so yeah, I, 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 so I want to take this moment now to speak about kind of how maps have factored into all of our disciplines. And I know that three of us are RISD based and one uh, professorial, but maybe just in, I think, I guess, thinking back to education and um, both prior to and maybe in higher education also, uh, like if, if there's any way that the, the map as a format has like impacted your teaching and your upbringing. And I can, I can start on that. Uh, Cause sorry, going back to maybe this slide too. For the Mer Mercator one, I remember, um, well, I, I mean, I grew up in Texas, and so everything is so different there. I think we took uh, two years of Texas history that was required, and world history was just an elective, so like very selective in their uh, knowledge. But the only thing I learned about Africa was mostly that it's exploitative purposes, so that enslaved people came from there, not so much about the various cultures. Um, on this vast continent, but uh, yeah, it's just, I guess, implicit and inherent biases con considered with these uh, different projections that are, of course, unintentional, but maybe not. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think learning up or growing up and learning about these uh, alternative forms of understanding the world around us. Uh, and then I guess focusing on like the, um, what's the word? the selective, the, 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 the personal choice that I made to kind of study non-American and non-European perspectives. Uh, I think that's led to me finding other sources that aren't as um, available to everybody. But uh, so yeah, I think so. So from my perspective, maps have always been bad. And I hate that um, in a lot of exhibitions for non American and non-European art, there's always, there always seems to be a map in the gallery to kind of give a sense that um, nobody knows these non-Eurocentric places. And uh, so, yeah, it's always been a, I've, I've always had a, a weird relationship with maps, but yeah, what, what are your backgrounds? I think I don't really deal with maps in, in any specific way, but I can talk about my experience with maps. And I think going to what Carson was discussing about the projections, which I I just took for granted before when I was growing up that this is a map and this is if you spread the globe out, this is how it would look. Um, but then I remember seeing at one point, you know, a different orientation where it wasn't, you know, the Atlantic that was centered in the map and, and how structure, like how much that changed my understanding of the world of just this like movement of what was being centered on the map. And so I, I guess what, what that draws my attention to with maps is the, um, the implicitness of which we internalize an abstraction because it is an abstraction of the globe. And yet it has all these sort of ideological ramifications and in these quite simple changes in terms of, of the three that we're looking at, you know, different projections, how they dramatically change the way that we understand and the world and through those changes like in the spirit of Mona Hatoum, I think it really highlights a lot of the assumptions that get made in map making about people and about other countries and who gets who gets to be the the, the subject of history. Mapping is a big part of graphic design, or it's kind of like a chunk subset of graphic design. And just even in a broad 
broadly speaking, uh, you can map time, you can map other things and not just the globe, but it's always um, a design challenge uh, to take something, it's a translation that you're going from time to 2D space or 3D uh, representation to a 2D representation. And, and anytime you have translation, something gets lost, but sometimes something can be found. So that's always an exciting challenge. Um, and for me particularly, um, I love uh, the history of maps and looking at old maps and seeing uh, people I mean, some of it's a factor of technology. Obviously, they didn't have satellites. So the way that they were collecting information was very different. But also, um, I, we get so used, these maps are so prevalent now that they're kind of ingrained in our brains in a certain way. And to think about that people didn't see the world that way a long time ago and thought of things with drag, like they thought it was totally appropriate to put dragons and, and wild creatures and have their maps be kind of more whimsical. Um, is is kind of a delightful thing in its own way. Um, I'm a historian of the pre-modern Islamic world and when Tiana asked me to focus on maps it kind of threw me because I, I, I deal with very few maps not that there wasn't medieval Islamic cartography but um, it's a much smaller area um, when compared to other intellectual uh, areas that Muslims pursued. But one thing that I did think about was that Muslims think a lot, medieval Muslims thought a lot about space and a lot about geography, and they wrote extensively about it. And uh, more often than not, they didn't illustrate those observations of maps. So I was thinking of a ninth century work on uh, the city of Mecca. It's a huge, huge work called Akbar al Makkah. And it has no maps, but the author claims at the beginning to, to describe every part of Mecca cubit by cubit. Um, so he did very clearly, you look at those descriptions, he wanted his readers to visualize Mecca. He wanted to connect Mecca with this vast uh, Islamic literary tradition, but there wasn't a visual component. Um, then you get things like the Book of Curiosities, where we only recently discovered the visual component. It was translated into, originally written in Arabic, translated into multiple languages in the pre-modern period. But none of those copyists included the maps which were original to the, to, 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 to the book, presumably due to issues of you know, the complexity of reproduction. Um, uh, but thinking about non-visual ways of representing geography I thought was was important and also a challenge to historians of the pre-modern Islamic Islamic world. Um, one thing I wanted to add is that this is one of the fastest growing areas in Islamic studies or pre-modern Islamic studies, uh, looking at Islamic cartography, not from a mathematical or very technical perspective, but looking at, at it as a way of interpreting uh, the world, uh, looking at it um, as a kind of a literary field of study. So there's a lot of great work going on really in the last 10 years or so. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I wish I had included all of these uh, pre and, and medieval pieces and maps as well, because they're so, like talking about it is already so mysterious and interesting, but when, once you see them and the different uh, languages imposed and everything, it's great. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to send some afterwards too, but thinking back to something Connor said, um, just, I guess, just uh, continuing about the fluidity and kind of um, permeability of, of maps and especially Mona Hatoum's reading. Um, I think that was one of the uh, driving forces between, or for me actually like finding some uh, technology pieces that allow you to superimpose different states and or sorry, different countries over each other. And so kind of in the spirit of this um, diagram, there's one I found that I'll send in the chat too, but it allows you to, uh, like one of the examples was putting India on top of um, Europe. And there are so many, like just India as a, as a whole, and it's uh, being included and wrapped up into Islamic art as a very broad um, category. Uh, it has like 22 different languages and hundreds of dialects and so many different cultures in that one space that could really like take up a majority of Europe. So just 
yeah, there, there are so many different um, different aspects of the world that aren't really legible when certain choices like map projections are made before you're even able to kind of like think about um, those relationships. But uh, so yes, now I have the um, the opening image for this program on the website. Some of the uh, screenshots from Con or sorry from Carson's awesome video that she created for the exhibition. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through some of these, I guess, while we talk, because Car Carson did already uh, speak about some of this. But um, so the intention in even making this map from uh, my like list of wants when we first started this conversation was um, making sure that again that this map wasn't just an extension of a tool of empire. It like it's not supposed to be um, the end all be all of uh, what the Islamic world entails. Um, and so with some of the objects coming from this uh, exhibition, if you can kind of see from these markers, uh, they're not all centered around West Asia. We have some on the Eastern coast of America, um, pretty far south in India, pretty high up in China. So um, yeah, just trying to complicate people's um, perspective of what the Islamic world means and hoping to present a very, very contemporary and um, fun, digital, very bright colored, brightly colored uh, map of what our unique uh, globe could look like just based on the RISD's collection. Um, so yeah, and, and Carson, feel free to tell me to stop or go forward. I'm just gonna scroll through. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, this is, um, so you can see the, the background color change from white to black. That's partially this particular map is being projected onto a wall. And uh, when it, the museum gallery is somewhat dark. So when we projected it with a white background, there's a case right across from it. And uh, we had to turn the background to black so that the contrast came down a little bit. So that's, that's why you're seeing this. Um, but yeah, is there, should I, just start or do you have anything else you want to add, Tiana? I can add around, but just like that this was the most, uh, this is the most recent screenshot or a screenshot of the most recent mm -hmm. video. Yeah. And then yeah, I guess this is from, more, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> and from different slides, you can kind of get a sense how uh, the objects float around the map. Um, and then we have some pictures of the so yeah, at the end, there will be a good flash of all of these objects and where they come from and how it kind of differs from what I hope would be people's, um, well, not that I hope people have misconceptions, but to kind of counter misconceptions about what the Islamic world means and kind of bringing in these areas like um, Eastern Asia with China and Africa back into the uh, limited binary of um, like the global, North versus global south, uh, east and west. Like the, I don't, yeah. I'm, like even now, I'm not sure where exactly Africa would fit into that, especially when you go outside of North Africa, which is now um, like more broadly considered part of the Islamic world and the Middle East. Um, oh yeah, this was another one of the earliest iterations. It's an early iteration. But it's also so we here. This this isn't one of the earliest earliest, but um, at this point we had decided to use these little diamonds to indicate where the objects were. At first, we had talked about um, uh, illustrating the kind of uh, political and geographical areas of uh, like the empires, et cetera, um, that went with each object, but that became kind of difficult. And also we're dealing with objects that are um, this, one here is kind of an earlier one and uh, it's coming from, it's Persian and uh, it has no particular artist um, because it's old enough that we don't know or that information wasn't kept. Um, whereas we also have contemporary works in this show that are very precise. We know who made them, exactly where they're from, where they were when they made it, and that's a very different geographical data. And you know, we're, you're dealing with in early objects, 
entire empires and in later objects a city and those are very different um, masses of land so when we were experimenting with showing like the entire area of Persia that would be this was from the 1400s like first of all it's it's difficult to say I, I went through lots of maps to try to figure out what does Persia in the 1400s mean and that's that's itself is a a difficult question so it felt like um, putting little approximate pin marks were a better solution than trying to map out giant swaths of land for some of the earlier ones that felt a little bit um, uh, not quite the right uh, visual representation of what we were trying to do. Yeah, so one, I think I made it really complicated in the beginning by like also having difficult titles that aren't also aren't as like legible always to the, the different communities coming into the museum. Um, and by including, as Carson said, every single empire that these objects might have come from. So um, I think, again, also up to speculation since we don't have a lot of information about these objects, but at the 14, in the 1400s at this time, um, Timur Timurid Empire was pretty um, popular, pretty uh, active in this time period. So like choosing the different borders was again, not very legible, uh, really hard to understand and always changing and hard to really even flush out when we have 30 different objects to put up on a screen that people are only gonna pay attention to for so long. Um, and I think one of the earliest, or sorry, I keep saying earliest, but one of the suggestions that Carson had was like uh, making this really fun and interactive. So it says right about here, and I really, Sorry, so around the circle, it says right about here, again, to get that approximate location. And it seemed fun and contemporary and everything that we were all thinking, but- um, It's not particularly <laughs> legible. <laughs> so it defeats the purpose, but- Yeah. Yeah, so, we were trying similarly to, I mean, obviously we're not, we're working in a digital space. We're not working with beautiful cotton paper, but trying to think about how to make this thing that looks, in many ways kind of authoritative show that it's still an approximation which is which is a challenge um, it's a little hard to see here but um, the when I trace the Winkle triple map um, I I kind of pixelated the borders a little bit to show a sense of imprecision um, and kind of fun geometry I had a question for you, Carson, uh, about mm -hmm. the design and thinking about, because we were talking about projection with maps and how there's always like a translation that happens. And I didn't realize that this map is going to be projected onto the wall. Uh, so there's a sense of chance, right, with your design and how it lands on the wall. And I was wondering if there were any, besides, you know, the color background, were there any, was there anything unexpected that happened in that process? <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean, it's a work in progress. Also, I don't know if Tiana, if you want to move forward and show because also because we're working with a digital thing, we have the ability to um, add movement, which is what makes me excited about it. Um, I am. Uh, this isn't exactly my wheelhouse to begin with, but I I do work with motion, so that was exciting, um, and. Yeah, one of the issues, <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is mechanical issues, such as like the white being too bright in the space. Um, and the projector itself is not particularly high resolution. So a lot of the fine details get a little bit fuzzy. So um, trying to deal with the type and uh, contrast with that, um, we had to make some adjustments. But overall, it's getting projected on a a flat surface so there's no di distortion in that regard um, but yeah it's always you're always dancing with technology and i i think um just continuing off uh, pretty selective and again what we talked about all of the maps having to make different compromises like um so in this both poles are missing and that was very much an intentional choice but again limiting because of course it's not a correct rendition of any map but just what's represented in the collection uh, and so yeah like this was an intentional um, erasure of parts of the world to kind of drive this point home I guess um, 
it was also sort of a point of convenience because uh, Antarctica is large and there was nothing on our particular map that was relevant there and it didn't fit as nicely into the uh, 16 by 9 feel that we needed to have <laughs> so it had to go <laughs> speaking of technological um, limitations um, so yeah some of these pieces uh, and I'm not sure if they factor into this video but uh, so the reason it's titled objects and artists in time and place is because as Carson and uh, mentioned earlier, some of these um, objects have artists attributed with them, and we know where they were born, where they died. And so sometimes, like with uh, Malik Sidibe, they he was born in and died in Mali, so it's easy to pinpoint like where exactly his work was made, but there are some artists who are like, oh, this is great. So Hazel mm Shaikh -hmm. was born in New York, but um, was photographing and, and having a lot of work done in um, East Africa. So like we get to pinpoint both where they're from and where they're working and kind of show the diaspora and that and not not as complicated as um, as it could be because there's, um, I guess, like going back back uh, more historically for every family or for every artist, um, like Fazl Shaikh was uh, ethnically from uh, Pakistan when it was still India, but born in New York and working in Africa and uh, Central Asia. So there's like a lot of um, different uh, regions that these artists kind of inhabit. Uh, and so, yeah, I wanted that to shine through uh, explicitly again with like New Yorker or New York based photographers um, working around the world and uh, another uh, RIS dealum actually. So um, yeah, just, just showing the different types of relationships and how it's not always uh, even though we might only know so much about the work, just bringing in as much context as possible. Um, oh yeah, so I guess another point showing how uh, these objects are coming from the, as early as the 10th, no, the 11th century up until 2017. So like a pretty broad swath of time in addition to geographies. Um, and, and going back to the digital content, I think the movement was one of the, please correct me if I'm wrong, Carson, it was one of the, the latest suggestions, like to make it more um, mobile. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, as I, I mentioned before, um, this isn't particularly like most, or this is a little bit different than the work that I've done in the past. and. If I, if I were just tasked with uh, doing a map, it would have like twisty dragons and be a little bit bonkers, but that is not what is necessary now, especially um, one of the challenges with this is the uh, amount of data that has to go into it and it has to get packed into this space and maps by themselves are complicated. Um, someone had asked a question, um, in the chat about uh, smaller islands getting lost. And yeah, they, that these, um, you can see there, there's a bunch of small islands, but there are probably ones that didn't make it. I, I traced this particular map um, by hand. And so it, it's itself an approximation. I tried to do the best that I could to make it a like accurate representation, but um, there's always a little bit of fuzziness there. And, and so, yeah, now we're supposed to be moving towards the um, discussion-based time for, for Alan and Connor and Carson and I to kind of um, get more into how maps have factored into our, our teaching practices and learning practices. So I, may, I guess we can start on that and then also rope in these these questions as well, but uh, so let's see. One of my questions, and we already talked about some of this, um, I guess like speculatively, um, what do we all imagine that maps will look like in the future? I know we're all having to, at least those of us working in a museum, we're having to um, argue with ourselves and kind of consider what the future of museums looks like. So I guess this makes it 
this like draws its attention away from us a little bit and towards uh, more broadly, but we've already heard ex examples from Alan, for example, about um, the non-visual map of Mecca. And so I think that's already just a wonderful um, suggestion. But yeah, like what, what do we imagine maps to be? Our orientation to maps, it's very different. I think very few of us when we're going places, for example, like pull out a paper map and, and chart out where we're going to go. So the, the digital map, I think, and including just directions, right? When I do directions, I always have it facing, you know, I don't have Cardinal North. I don't follow the true directions, right? The, the maps are always oriented towards my body. Uh, so I think what gets lost in that is the like the larger connectivity. It's, you know, that, um, you, you're just sort of seeing your much more micro movements. Um, so things maybe are with the, as we get bigger, maybe things are getting smaller in some cases with maps. I was just reading an article the other day about how the U.S. is um, allowing uh, private companies to um, sell uh, materials that they've mined on the moon, which is in violation of, of some trees and whatnot. But um, in the future, I imagine um, Earth might not be in a traditional map. Um, will it just, will we just see Earth um, or will uh, maps, um, even, you know, at least a two-dimensional map, even um, expand in some way? For me, I don't know what future maps are going, to, are going to look like, but one nice thing about different kinds of technologies uh, from a pedagogical perspective is being able to show students huge numbers of different kinds of maps and give them a window into the process of how those maps were created. So in my modern Middle East class, I always begin with the Sykes-Picot map of the Middle East, where you can actually see in the originals where they've drawn the lines with, with rulers, which uh, then, become, then become borders. And then you get into the more complicated question, is that the source of the conflicts in the current Middle East? And uh, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. The, perhaps the bloodiest conflict in the Middle East of the 20th century was the Iran-Iraq War. And uh, that border was drawn in the 16th century. So it's a complicated answer. Uh, you can also show students, again, with these kinds of technologies, the uh, Soviets' uh, maps of Central Asia, where they got teams of Soviet uh, anthropologists in. And uh, because they knew it all belonged to the Soviet Union, they could draw as many squiggly lines as, the, as they liked exactly around the borders of ethnic groups that these anthropologists said existed there. And now that those are no longer Soviet areas, those borders to negotiating those borders becomes very, very complicated. So uh, for me as a historian, uh, it's exciting being able to show all of these different kinds of maps and the drafts of the maps and being able to compare them and then think about uh, how that does impact conflict and maybe the possibilities of drawing better borders and better maps in the future. So I just included in the chat a couple of um, websites to kind of um, entertain you at the end of this, um, if you want. But uh, I, I agree. I think one of the things I was so drawn to with this uh, native land map, actually, is how we're so, or at least I'm so um, attuned to maps, making sure that the borders never like overlap. And of course, with these native cultures in North America, like over time, um, and even now they're constantly in flux and constantly evolving. So I think maybe, um, though I, 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 I have some affinity for Mona Hatoum's piece with borders just completely being gone, um, but uh, that one seems nice. And I feel like uh, language also text is always um, assumed. And I guess by picking English, the English version of everything, um, because of course every country in uh, the Middle East like doesn't have its own, like Algeria is not called Algeria, for example. So there's just, um, yeah, I feel like there's infinite ways to do this, but I'm, I'm, I'm considering, I'm going back to one of the questions earlier, speaking about the, um, the origin of the font and design for the text on the, the map. And I can bring that back up. But uh, I think that was wonderful research that our, one of our interns did, Hilary DuPont, if I have it correct. Yes, Hilary, um, Hilary started 
uh, with the con or the design concept that is um, driving the exhibition design. And so that's this um, font that you see up here. Yep, uh, that is a font called Calcula, and it is designed by a woman who based it off of Kufic script, which is a traditional Arabic calligraphy, and it uses um, modern scripting to create these um, ligatures that you see, which are these instances where like the T gets bigger than the C and the S and kind of sits over it, which is something that we can do now with um, code in fonts. So that uh, has, uh, lends a nice uh, look and visual interest and also reference to um, Arabic script. This is also, um, there's several options that you can um, layer these things on top of each other. So in this case, there's two layers of text so that you get this sort of three-dimensional look. And then to pair with that, um, the smaller sans serif is called surrogat and it's by the same uh, type company. And it, we chose it just so that it would, uh, the geometry and the kind of height that you get, this is a particularly, the uh, Caligula, the display font is a particularly tall um, font. So we went with something that kind of paired with the geometry and the height of Caligula, or Calcula, excuse me. <laughs> And that's actually one of the, um, that is the font and design for the exhibition uh, mm -hmm. graphic as well. And I, I like how, I don't think it was intentional or maybe it was, but um, picking a designer from the region too, I think they're based in India. So mm -hmm. like, again, speaking to the different languages that are kind of wrapped up into Islamic art in general. Um, well, I, I, as people are, more people are looking to define a world um, less by borders and uh, more in other ways, um, in, either in things that we share. Uh, in particular, what came to mind for me was something that we all are sharing globally is uh, climate change bearing down and, and what that might mean for, you know, mapping, not being so much about just, you know, where certain um, countries as we've defined them are or cultures as we've defined them are, but um, more, uh, perhaps pressing matters um, like uh, bodies of, of water, uh, areas likely to face challenges from climate change, mass migration, danger areas. Um, I think that'll be a significant design challenge for mapping in, in the future. Um, essentially, it's gonna be information people need to have and maps will be critical and borders are going to matter less or more. <laughs> And, and one of the things actually that I was thinking about in uh, developing this exhibition and talking through it with different staff members was uh, the Muslim ban that was put up under uh, this current administration and how just with like specific borders, whether or not they were majority Muslim or not, um, and that being a, a, a method of discriminating and like not allowing into countries. So it was like a personal drive to want less um, less solid border lines. And I guess also not to bring politics into it too, but all of the um, rhetoric around the politics now and, and like our, sorry for the noise around, but um, like the different ideals of democracy in our country now and whether or not, like Texas, I'm from Texas, so I feel like no shame, but they've always wanted to secede. And now I'm thinking about like the North and South and whether or not um, this may be uh, more pressing, like you said, like in the next couple months. Oh, and uh, Professor Allen, he just linked a wonderful link and I'm so excited to press it. Uh, Kufic inspired font also. And uh, not to bring up the, the, well, maybe I should so share my screen again, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. One of the um, pieces that I was most excited for in the exhibition was the Persian ewer, um, because you can't really tell from the picture since it's like solid blue now, but um, it's a very light turquoise-ish color with um, red, black, and white, and blue figurines on, on uh, sorry, blue figures 
around it. And so like, again, kind of speaking towards the types of works that mostly come out in uh, Islamic and African exhibitions. It's always like earth toned, dark, old, um, organic material, I think. And so this was one of the ones that kind of, I thought would uh, be complex enough to, to make people question uh, whether or not, and I saw somebody's comment in the chat too about questioning everything now. Um, but I thought, I think this was a piece that kind of led me to posit uh, pink and blue as like bright colors for a map, which I, I realize now might be unprofessional, but I'm, I'm still like really excited for it. But yeah, I guess um, now if, if, if people would like to speak more generally or ask questions either in the chat or in person. I'll go one more time. <laughs> Sorry, on the I'll hush. Um, I remember being very young when I first learned that American maps um, uh, made Africa quite small, and that was a real sort of mind blower for me. Um, you know, I've had many years of education between now and then, and I work a lot on equity issues in a lot of sectors, very closely with community. And I think that could have been a, a moment where I first sort of realized I've been <laughs> told a lie and um, uh, because that's what it is, is a, is a lie, you know, if you, if you use a visual to, to distort um, reality in some way. Um, and I think that led me, uh, probably was a piece along with some other things that I learned in my youth that led me to, to kind of question, question what I was learning, um, the sort of Eurocentric um, viewpoints in a lot of different ways. Um, and I'm also sort of fascinated. I love beautiful maps, as someone else said too. I love looking at them and thinking about them. And there's, you know, usually a lot of male names associated with the, the drawing of them. And um, that's another thing I question, who really drew this, who really made this, who really designed this, built this, thought this, because women couldn't get credit for a really long time. So I think like everything else in map making and, you know, map drawing, when I look at older maps, um, I wonder. Um, and I hope that there are people who will begin to uncover in this space as in others, um, you know, uh, who might have been behind it that just didn't get credited. Um, slaves and indentured servants, you know, anyone who wasn't allowed to kind of have their work shown would have had it shown under a, a different name. I don't remember anything about uh, cartography and the early like European um, explorers heading across the Atlantic, but I'm thinking now about like ships and how they're always named after the the conqueror and and yeah, I, I wonder who all is um who all actually did the work in in um what is it the astrolabe like all the different types of measurements and um, directionalities with distance and everything. This is um, not um, a professional or educated comment, but early in the um, the shutdown in the United States there was a, um, a program that had the International Space Station astronauts um, do a visit on the program. And they were referring to the pandemic, but their view from space is of a world without borders and boundaries for the most part, their, their visual perspective on the Earth. And they, they, one of the astronauts had said something like, um, a planet in an earth in crisis is still beautiful. And I just really, it stayed with me all these months because um, we're talking about who draws the lines, the consequences of the lines and fighting over them and identity. And um, it's interesting to take a step back even as far as from orbit to see a different perspective of the world. Thank you for that. I don't think I've ever thought outside of the uh, limitation of earth. So this is, this is great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, and, and now that we're right at one and a little past one, actually, uh, I, will, I will let everyone head back. I know this is the middle of the day. So thank you so much for joining us all to speak about this and um, kind of listen to our panderings about what's to come. Um, and I know, I know the museum is only open to students at the moment, but this exhibition will be up until uh, the summertime. So I hope uh, in, the, in the next few months, you'll be able to come visit and see everything that Carson, uh, all the work that she put into this. So thank you.